This is Marion's Natural News. Hello everybody, this is naturalist James Sanderson, and welcome to the Terradice Nature Preserve. Today's episode, we're going to be talking about vernal pools. Some of you might be wondering, well, what in the world is a vernal pool? Well, if you've already seen some of the description, a vernal pool is a special type of wetland. So, kind of outline with today's program, we're going to talk about what makes this place special. Also, we're going to talk about some of the different types of wildlife that might live in or around a fernal pool. And then we might also discuss how you might be able to help your local fernal pools if you have them on your property. Stay tuned and enjoy the show, folks. So now that you have a rough idea about what a fernal pool is, uh, as we said, it's a uh, type of wetland. And it's actually a special kind of wetland. Uh, some of you might have heard of things called marshes, swamps, bogs. Um, those are all wetlands, but they're different categories or different types of wetlands. And a uh, fernal pool is exactly the same. So the definition of a fernal pool is they are seasonal wetlands that fill with water each year, but typically dry out during some part of the year, typically summer. Uh, they are isolated wetlands that occur in a forest setting. So, yes, yeah, so these fernal pools are designed to be full in the spring and dry in the summertime. Uh, so this is why it's especially important right now to go visit a fernal pool because if you wait till late spring, early summer, that fernal pool will not be there, especially if we're in a drought season. So the two most common things that all fernal pools have in common, rather it's a large one or a small one, is the first thing, it does not hold water permanently. So like we said before, it's designed to be full in the spring and dry in the summertime. The other thing that all fernal pools have in common is they do not have any fish. If they have fish, then those fish are going to eat everything from the salamanders to the frogs to the macroinvertebrates and all the other special types of wildlife that may live in a fernal pool. Uh, so that's why it's also important that a fernal pool is not fed by any type of creek or stream. Uh, so yeah, so if you think you have a fernal pool, kind of look all around. If it's, again, it's being fed by some other form of body of water and like a creek or stream, that is not a fernal pool. So when you arrive to the Terradice Nature Preserve, uh, when, once you look out past the shelter house, you'll see this large body of water. Some of you might be wondering, is this a fernal pool? Uh, technically, it is not. It is a wetland, though, uh, but it is not a fernal pool because if you remember, the definition of a fernal pool is uh, it cannot be fed by any type of creeks or streams, and also uh, should not have any fish. I haven't found any fish in here, but if you were to travel further down um, in this wetland, you would find uh, small creeks and streams feeding into this. During the summer, as long as we're not under a drought, uh, there is some water um, that is here. Uh, so again, remember, fernal pools are designed to be full at this time of year, but to be dry uh, during the summertime. Uh, so again, this is not a fernal pool. It's just a normal old uh, wetland. Welcome to another fernal pool sighting here at Teradice. As you can see, uh, again, it doesn't look like a very large uh, area, but this is probably as large as this fernal pool is probably going to get. Uh, some fernal pools can be relatively good size, and some of them can be small like this. The design of a fernal pool is not to hold water for a very long time. And uh, even though this is a um, relatively small fernal pool, there's still a lot of unique wildlife that you could find. Reptiles, amphibians, macros, and uh, vertebrates, and all sorts of creatures. And this is actually kind of what's considered a newly flooded stage of the fernal pool. Uh, so within time, uh, the water will start to decrease and decrease, and then when you get until about uh, late June or so, then you're getting to really a small puddle of water, and then by the time it's the hot summer heat, the fernal pool water is not even here unless we had a wet summer. Uh, so to always keep that in mind. 
But during this phase, again, there's going to be a lot of fibian activity, a lot of macroinvertebrate activity going on. Uh, so I always highly recommend if you find a fertile pool in your property, just take some time, look through, like we saw in the one video, you know, get a net, uh, see what kinds of critters that are living in there. Make sure you respect the animals that are living in there as well. You know, if there's some logs that are uh, kind of close by, kind of flip them over. There could be some salamanders in there right now. Uh, vernal pools are very important for a lot of our salamander species here in the state of Ohio. Uh, this is a great breeding grounds. And you actually might see uh, quite a bit of uh, frog eggs and salamander eggs. And we'll kind of talk about the difference uh, here in a little bit. As we mentioned before, fernal pools are a seasonal wetland. So within their name, they have phases, or you could say seasons, just like the seasons we experience here in the state of Ohio. So the first phase I decided to start with was the newly flooded phase. So this is the time of year when you visit a fernal pool, it's going to hold a lot of water. And this is probably when a lot of our amphibian and macroinvertebrate activity could probably be the highest, uh, and also the next phase that we'll discuss. Uh, but the future uh, video clips that you'll see um, at Paradise Nature Preserve, it will be in this phase. Uh, so again, remember later in time, the water will slowly start to decrease. So now we're talking about mid-April, and now we're talking about the early to mid-spring phase. So the water is starting to decrease a little bit again. Uh, again, still amphibian macrofruit activity is probably still pretty high at this point. Uh, so still a really good time to see a lot of uh, unique uh, wildlife, fairy shrimp. Um, those are really unique uh, species that live in Sinofernal Pool. We'll discuss those here in uh, a little bit. So now we're talking about the third phase, the late spring summer phase. So this is where we're getting into about late May, early June. And as you realize, there's just a small puddle of water. So there's probably not a lot of wildlife activity probably going on at this point. There's probably maybe some macroinvertebrates, maybe some fairy shrimp are still there, uh, maybe uh, a amphibian here and there. But other than that, you're not going to see, again, a lot of wildlife at the fernal pools. But they're still important for wildlife because it's probably providing A, shelter, or B, uh, water. So now we're going to enter the drying phase. So this is about middle of June, July. Uh, so there's basically no water in here. I mean, depends on the summer. If we got a wet summer, there'll probably be a little bit of water. But if it's a nice drought, you will probably won't see any water at all. So it's just basically looks like a little uh, muddy pit. And uh, this is especially this phase and the next phase we'll talk about um, are the two phases that fernal pools uh, have a real problem because a lot of people don't know that they exist or they are there because, again, they just look like just little uh, muddy areas. So now we're on the last phase, the dry phase. So no water at this time. Doesn't look muddy like the last phase. Uh, so this, again, this phase gets a lot of threats because, again, a lot of people don't know that they, uh, the fernal pools exist. But I do want to note one thing, that each phase that we kind of talked about, um, there is some type of wildlife that will either live or take advantage of the different phases of the fernal pools. And that's why fernal pools are very important. Now, yes, like we said earlier, probably the flooded phase and early spring phase that's probably where you're going to get your most wildlife. But then uh, those last three phases are, again, still important for wildlife. Uh, for the dry phase, we actually have a special salamander called the marble salamander that sometimes take advantage of dry fernal pools and she'll he'll lay her eggs underneath uh, the leaf litter because a lot of time that leaf litter is really moist. And that's where she likes to uh, lay her eggs. So, again, um, definitely I always recommend go out any time of the year and see what your fernal pools look like. And you'll be really amazed to find some type of wildlife. I have in my hand right here, this is called a D-net. 
It's net, it's shaped kind of like a D. And uh, this is a really cool uh, device in any aquatic setting. Rather a wetland, a pond, a stream, uh, or a fertile pool. It's just to help collect some of the uh, macro invertebrates or some of the small critters that might live in here. So I'd always recommend if you have one or two people, especially if more, it helps. But kind of put your D-net into the ground, in the water, and then have somebody kind of splash and kick. Because a lot of these little macro invertebrates, they like to hide underneath leaves and rocks and things like that. Well, since it's just me, I'm just going to kind of do a little kick. And I bring my net up. And then I kind of sift through and see what did I catch. As you look in this video, we caught lots of stuff. We caught a frog, some snails, these little things you'll see swimming around. Those are some macro invertebrates, such as the mayfly nymphs. Uh, we've also caught some dragonfly nymphs. And uh, as you can see, if we touch and make sure you moved, a um, lot, of, lot of unique wildlife inside a fernal pool. So this little bucket just kind of shows what lives underneath uh, the fernal pool. So now that you've gotten a small taste about some of the different types of wildlife in a fernal pool, now we're really going to dig deep about the wildlife that really take advantage of fernal pools, amphibians, macro invertebrates, and plants. So the first forms of life we're going to talk about are frogs and toads. Just basic uh, difference between the two. Uh, frogs are more uh, in aquatic setting. They're slimy, mucousy, uh, smooth skin. Frogs are more land dwelling. Uh, they're warty um, or bumpy, you could say. Now, both frogs and toads will uh, use a fernal pool to lay their eggs. And uh, to tell the difference, frogs lay their eggs in a more of an egg clump or what's called an egg mass versus toads will lay them more in a chain. Uh, this time of year, you will definitely see some of our uh, frogs take advantage of the pools, such as the peepers, the chorus frogs, the leopard frogs. Uh, just to name a, a few species. And uh, this is a, a great breeding ground, so you're going to hear them uh, singing a lot. So if you're really wanting to uh, study frogs, uh, definitely infernal pools is a place to go to find them. Uh, but, but like we talked about with toads, uh, toads are really not going to live in infernal pools. Again, they're just going to basically take advantage, lay the eggs, and then uh, go off elsewhere in a forest setting. So the next forms of life we're going to talk about are salamanders and newts. And some of you might be wondering, uh, what are they and what is the difference? Uh, well, yes, salamanders and newts are a type of an amphibian and they're cousins. Uh, but what really makes them different, it's their life cycles. Um, or basically, how, how do they live? Uh, we'll start with salamanders. So on typically, salamanders will start as an egg. They will hatch. Uh, they'll live inside the fertile pool for quite some time, um, within a year or so or less, uh, just depending on what species. And then they will um, escape the fertile pool, and they will usually find a home underneath a log or rock or somewhere else. Uh, the, the types of salamanders you might find are like spotted salamanders, Jefferson salamanders, like we talked about earlier, marble salamanders. It's what's called the amastoma salamanders. They're also known as the mole salamanders. Um, the other group of salamanders are called the plathanas. Um, those are like your redbacks, your stream, uh, two-line salamanders. Those guys don't really, uh, typically don't use fernal pools um, as a breeding ground. So newts, uh, again, newts are cousins of salamanders, and they also start as an egg. Uh, they hatch. They'll stay in the fernal pool for just a short time of their life, but then they'll escape the water and they'll live on land between three to five years of what's called the F stage. And uh, they're brightly red, uh, so they're telling predators, hey, don't eat me, I might taste bad, I could be poisonous. Uh, so again, they'll stay out there for quite a, quite a bit of time, and then they'll go back into an infernal pool, turn into basically an aquatic stage, and live there for the rest of their lives. So that just gives you um, an information about these two creatures. Very unique, very cool, um, and very different. So if you ever want to see salamanders or newts, again, got to look in a fernal pool. 
So now we're going to talk about macro invertebrates. If you're not sure, macro are creatures you can see with your eye. Micro is small. You would need a microscope. And invertebrates is creatures without a backbone. So put it together. It is a creature without a backbone that you can see with your eyes. And uh, quite a few macro invertebrates will definitely take advantage of the fernal pools. If we saw in that one video that we talked about, mayflies, dragonfly, damselfly, nymphs, uh, they'll uh, lay their uh, eggs and they'll uh, they'll hatch inside fernal pools. Um, some of our uh, snails, some of our um, things like that will we'll, uh, take advantage of pools. But the really interesting wildlife that... Uh, that really makes fernal pools probably a very unique place is the only type of animal you only can find fernal pool and nowhere else is what's called the fairy shrimp. And fairy shrimp are a crustacea, so they are related to crabs and lobsters and uh, crawdads, and uh, they don't get very big. I think on average they can get about the size of a dime. Um, when I went into the fernal pool to record all this footage, uh, probably because of the cold snap, couldn't find any. Uh, but here soon, we'll probably be able to find some at the Paradise Nature Preserve. Uh, probably for a later video, we'll probably go into a description more about uh, fairy shrimp. But again, that's what makes, again, Fernal Pools a pretty special place because, again, you can only find fairy shrimp there. So now we've talked a lot about uh, animal life inside the Fernal Pool, we'll talk a little bit about plant life. So the different types of plants you might find inside a fernal pool or around a fernal pool are herbaceous and woody plants. So herbaceous are soft tissue plants like your flowers. And uh, some of the flowers you might find, uh, you could find cattails. You don't want too many, but a couple here and there is not bad. Uh, some pondweed, uh, some arrowhead plantain, um, duckweed, uh, just a lot. Um, some of the uh, woody plants, uh, willows. Swamp white oaks, um, those are just a couple uh, examples of some different types of plants that you can find in or around a fernal pool. So again, we've talked about all the different types of wildlife that lives in or around a fernal pool, but now you have to go out and explore your local fernal pool. You never know what you might find. Might find some toads, some salamanders, some macros, all sorts of plants. But again, you got to take time to find all these unique animals in your local parks. And also keep in mind that there might be other types of wildlife that may not live in or around a fernal pool, but might take advantage of a fernal pool. Some of your predators like bats, snakes, maybe your small uh, green herons. Uh, they'll definitely take advantage of the life uh, inside fern pool and might eat those, some of those animals. And um, you might actually have some animals might take advantage of, of fern pool to maybe find a drink or some shelter. Great example of that is a eastern box turtle. So just keep in mind that the animals, those animals, may not again live in or around a fern pool, but they'll definitely take advantage of the fern. All right, ladies and gentlemen, what I have here in my hand, this is a northern leopard frog which I found in one of the fernal pools here at the Teradice Nature Preserve. As we mentioned before, uh, fernal pools are full of amphibian life, uh, such as frogs and salamanders and newts. And uh, we actually don't want two different species of frogs to take advantage of a fernal pool, and that would be the American bullfrog and the green frog. And you're probably asking yourself, well, why? We got to remember, especially with bullfrogs, those guys can get pretty good size and uh, they'll eat anything that can fit in their mouth and they will even eat their own kind. Uh, so if you have a bullfrog, green frog infestation at a fernal pool, they'll end up eating all the salamanders, their eggs, the frogs and their eggs, all the macroinvertebrates, and the next thing you know, all you have is a fernal pool full of just only bullfrogs and green frogs. Um, so yeah, so again, we only just want certain species of frogs to take advantage uh, of the pool. Uh, so this is uh, their breeding season, uh, what we mentioned with salamanders, frogs as well. Uh, again, they'll lay their eggs inside fernal pools. Uh, so yeah, so this is why it's always, again, good to have some type of uh, netting because you never know what you can find inside 
uh, a fernal pool. Okay, so now that we've learned about what lives in a fernal pool, what is a fernal pool, and you think you might have a fernal pool, the next question you're going to ask, well, what can I do or how can I help my local fernal pool? Well, I picked some five easy steps that we, as our uh, citizens, what we can do to protect our local fernal pools on our property. So one of the first things that you should do is uh, maintain some tree cover. Uh, needs to be at least more than 50%. Uh, make sure the trees are, are good size, 20, 30 feet tall, because what happens is if you have a fernal pool that's really open, um, unfortunately, um, a lot of sunlight reaches down to the fernal pools and a lot of algae can overgrow um, those pool areas, um, which then can absorb a lot of the oxygen and then a lot of the wildlife cannot live um, in the fernal pool. So it does need to be uh, shaded. The other big thing is add what's called a buffer zone or a freeze zone, um, or you could say a safe zone, a lot of different uh, phases. Um, but it needs to be 164 feet or 50 meters. So if you're a person that runs uh, four-wheelers or if you uh, graze your cattle inside a forest setting, uh, again, if you think you have fernal pool on your property, again, give that fernal pool 164 feet or that 50-meter buffer zone because um, if you get too close, uh, especially with uh, your four-wheelers, your ruts, uh, will create these little areas which amphibians like sound manners will think oh hey that's a fertile pool they'll go in they'll lay their eggs and then what happens is the rut dries out really quick and those eggs don't have a chance to survive uh, so as long as you give this good safe distance uh, these types of wildlife will have a advantage of uh, surviving in this area uh, other thing too if you're a farmer or a person that applies any type of herbicides or pesticides or anything like that on your property uh, again uh, just kind of control your pesticide applications again give that that 50 meter bu buffer zone um, like number four we talked about uh, again minimize floor force floor disturbance uh, especially during the breeding season and number five is probably the most important of them all education tell people about fernal pools like we talked about about the phases of the fernal pool the, the biggest threat fernal pools face is during the summer because that is when they are dry and when they're dry people tend to think oh well they're really nothing it's just a little uh, wet spot in my forest I could put gravel or dirt or trash or, or anything like that uh, so yeah if as long as you educate your friends your families your neighbors these fernal pools or these unique ecosystems can keep thriving for future generations well, everyone, I hope you enjoyed today's program about fernal pools. Hopefully the information we give you, hopefully you can show this to your friends, your family, your neighbors, and maybe you might go through your property and say, well, maybe I have a fernal pool, and hopefully uh, you can use the information and protect your local fernal pools on your property. And not just your property, but your friends' properties and their friends, and if we continue this then education is power to protect our natural habitats so remember folks have fun be safe but most of all go out and explore your marion county parks i'm naturalist james anderson and i'll see you next time on marion's natural news